And William Weld, both former governors, are now seeking the White House and gaining ground in a new Fox News poll. Johnson and Weld now have support from 12% of registered voters, up two percentage points uh, since June. Clinton and Kane lead the pack at 44%, and the Trump pace ticket is nine points behind them at 35%. The question many are asking, can the libertarian ticket shake up this race? History shows us, yes, it is possible. Randy Kay tonight reports. No third-party candidate has ever reached the Oval Office, but that doesn't mean they didn't have a hand in who did. Back in 1912, former President Teddy Roosevelt left the Republican Party and ran on the Progressive Party, or Bull Moose ticket. Roosevelt essentially split the Republican vote with incumbent William Howard Taft. It likely cost Taft the presidency, handing the Oval Office to Democrat Woodrow Wilson instead. Fast forward to 1968, and another third-party candidate shook things up. This time, it was George Wallace. Wallace has the courage to stand up for America. Give him your support. The former governor of Alabama was considered a segregationist Democrat, opposing civil rights and fueling fear in America. It's a sad day in our country that you cannot walk even in your neighborhoods at night or even in the daytime. Wallace ran on the ticket for the American Independent Party. By pulling conservative Democratic votes, he cost Democrat Hubert Humphrey the election. Republican Richard Nixon walked away with the win. In 1992, it was Ross Perot's turn to shake up the race. Good afternoon. The volunteers in all 50 states have asked me to run as a candidate for president of the United States. The Texas billionaire ran as an independent and focused his presidential campaign on the national debt. Decide who you think will do the job. Pick that person in November because believe me, as I've said before, the party's over and it's time for the cleanup crew. On election day, Perot snagged 19% of the popular vote, likely costing Republican George H.W. Bush a second term. Then Governor Bill Clinton got the win. Bush refused to discuss Perot years later in the HBO documentary 41. Can you talk a little bit about Ross Perot? No, can't talk about him. I think he cost me the election. I don't like him. Ralph Nader played the spoiler in 2000. He won just 2.7% of the vote nationwide, but pulled in more than 97,000 votes in Florida. Republican George W. Bush beat Democrat Al Gore in Florida by just 537 votes. If most of Nader's supporters had voted for Gore instead, Gore would have won Florida and been elected president. Just moments ago, I spoke with George W. Bush and congratulated him on becoming the 43rd president of the United States. When Nader was questioned about his campaign's role in Gore's loss, he brushed it off. By the way, I do think that Al Gore cost me the election, especially in Florida. And, and that's far greater concern than whether I was supposed to help elect Al Gore. In 2016, an election year where both major party candidates have a likability problem, Third-party candidates see an opening once again. Randy Kay, CNN, New York. And the Libertarian Party nominees will take the stage here behind me very soon. The CNN Libertarian Town Hall begins right after this short break. We have four or five commercial breaks. At which point, if you need to at that point, get up and stretch your legs. Just wait. Good evening and welcome to the second CNN Libertarian Town Hall. I'm Anderson Cooper. Tonight, your chance to meet the candidates behind the party that's promising voters a different choice this November. In a tough-talking campaign. Temperamentally unfit. Crooked Hillary. He's talking moderation. How about a couple of guys in the middle? Gary Johnson and running mate Bill Weld. Two former governors with a single philosophy. We are fiscally conservative, over the top. We're socially liberal. The question now, can a polarized country come together behind that message and get behind these candidates? Uh, I wouldn't be doing this if there weren't the opportunity to win. But first, they've got to get the numbers to make the debates. You have to be at 15% in the polls. If they make it to the debate stage, then what? Could they make it to the White House? Or will they just play spoiler to either Clinton or Trump? It's your choice. Your choice. Your decision. Your questions tonight.
And welcome to all of you who are joining us here in New York, across the country, and watching around the world. We're being simulcast tonight on CNN International, CNN and Espan Espanol, CNN Go, and Sirius XM Satellite Channel 116. This is our second libertarian town hall, in no small part because of the growing interest in a third-party alternative. New polling just out tonight shows 12% support for libertarian nominee Gary Johnson in a three-way race with us here tonight. Some of those voters, Republicans, Democrats, Independents, Libertarians, all of whom share one thing. Thing. They say uh, they will not be voting for either Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton, or they haven't made up their mind. They've got questions. Can the libertarians provide better answers than what the other parties have been given so far? We'll see in the hour ahead. As always, the questions come mainly from the audience. We've looked them over to make sure they don't overlap. I'll ask a couple questions myself, but mostly staying out of the way. Let's get uh, right to it. Joining us right now, the libertarian presidential nominee, former Governor Gary Johnson of New Mexico, and his running mate, former Governor William Weld of Massachusetts. Thanks so much for being here. So, before we get to the uh, the audience questions, I, I just want to start off with a couple questions, uh, really out of the, the headlines today. We talked about this new poll, Fox News poll, shows you at twelve percent. That's only a three way poll. The last CNN poll, which was a four way poll with with uh, Jill Stein, uh, showed you at nine percent. Uh, that's the last time you were here. In our last four way CNN poll, which came out just on Monday, still had you at nine percent. What do you think you need to gain momentum? What what more? do you need to do? Well, uh, this interview right here is going to push us over 17, I'm sure. So oh, thank yeah, you, well, thank you well. very much, really. <laughs> but it was 9% before the last town hall, and well, you're still at 9%. Well, it's, well, well, it's, I don't want to knock our ability uh, to do no, that. No, it's, it's ratcheting up. I mean, we're reaching 25 million people now, social media-wise, and we're raising money. And, uh, of course, that gives us the ability to push that out. And so all the analytics look really good. You know, there's been a number of high-profile Republicans who who have said they're not going to be voting for, for, for Donald Trump. You just had Meg, Meg Whitman, who is a, a Republican uh, donor. Uh, she's now saying she's supporting Hillary Clinton. Obviously, you saw Mike Bloomberg, who was the uh, independent as a governor, as a, uh, as a mayor of New York, speaking the, at the Democratic convention for Hillary Clinton. It's got to be frustrating for you that, I mean, that Bloomberg didn't look at you, that Meg Whitman didn't look at you. What is your message to Republicans out there watching tonight? Well... Two former Republican governors uh, that uh, got reelected in heavily Democrat states. I think that speaks volumes. And not really frustrated. Um, just understanding how difficult it is to cross over the line if you're an elected uh, Republican or if you've been a former uh, elected Republican. Governor Well. Well, I think the message to Republicans is that uh, we were two of the most fiscally responsible, i.e. conservative governors in the United States when we served together back in the 90s. Gary and I were good friends then, we're, we're good friends now. But we were each rated the fiscally most conservative governor in the United States. Uh, and that, that takes some doing. We are, uh, you know, socially inclusive, tolerant, whatever word you want. In fact, we've been leaders on those issues. I was all by myself for a decade. Uh, early 90s, as I in remember. In the 90s, the er very early 90s. 91, okay, I think it was. Lesbian issues, yeah, yeah, right when I came into office. So we stand for the proposition, as I said at the Republican convention in Houston in 1992, we want the government out of your pocketbook and out of your bedroom. And I'll tell you, the polling shows that a majority of Americans think that. So, so what is it? Is it just a question of publicity? Is it just a well, question of the, the people just that, don't know what libertarians are? The idea that we should not be at those debates expressing what's a majority point of view in the country can only be laid at the door of the two-party monopoly, the duopoly that has a stranglehold on power in Washington. That's the R's and the D's who sometimes seem to exist mainly for the express purpose of killing each other. Let, let's talk about the Republicans a little bit more because obviously there's huge uh, divisions right now within the Republican Party. I mean, we just saw, seen yesterday Donald Trump refusing to endorse uh, Paul Ryan, refusing to endorse uh, John McCain. Do you see this as an opportunity for you? What's happening on the Republican side? Well, it's it, really both sides. I, I just pose the question if either uh, Trump or Clinton are elected, that uh, things will be more polarized than ever. Uh, neither side is going to get along with the other. Uh, 
And what if you elect a couple of former Republican governors, two-term, re-elected, running as libertarians? What if you elect them as president, vice but president, you, calling out both sides? How can you bring things, if you're calling out both sides, how can you bring things together in Washington? How can you do what a Hillary Clinton or I, Donald Trump I, I think do? it might be refreshing to have uh, a party that was not terribly partisan holding the White House. And we would hire the best people from the Democratic Party that we could find, the smartest people from the Republican Party that we could find the best people in the Libertarian Party. And our proposals out of the White House would not say, take that, you stupid D party or you stupid R party. It would be, you know, here's what we think. This is maybe kind of in the middle. Could we come together uh, around this? And the, the recipients of that information would not feel attacked, so they might be more likely to come to the table because they wouldn't feel like they were going to be made fools of. Uh, we're also proposing something unique, I believe, in that we're planning to do this as a partnership. Uh, what is it? How does that? I mean, that's well, how does it work? Uh, not having not having separate staffs, not being divided, but really uh, two heads for the price of one, and um, that it would be a plus for for the country. Believing that it, it helps that we've known each other for twenty years and sort of chose each other a long time ago to mm -hmm. be friends, and then again more recently. This this guy was my role model, um, becoming governor. Um, really, I held him up on a pedestal. So having him as the uh, on the ticket is beyond my wildest dreams. I want to hear about your vision of America right now because you know we've just come out of the, the two conventions where we heard very different visions of America. Donald Trump's vision of of how things are right now, and certainly Hillary Clinton's as. Well, how do you see where America is at? Uh, I don't think life in America has ever been better. I mean, we get along better, we communicate better, our kids are smarter than ever. We've got issues. I mean, when you look at Black Lives Matter, when you look at the discrimination that ex that is existing, uh, that has existed, but I, I think we're coming to grips with that. We're communicating better than we've ever communicated before. So we're going to come to grips with this, and we we do have issues, but uh, we need to address them. So, so optimism, the optimism. Country, the country's in a fine place, and it's still the envy of the world, you know, people envy our rule of law and uh, our economy and the way we conduct ourselves in general, but there's an elephant in the room, which is the paralysis in Washington as a result of the ferocious uh, hatred of the two parties for each other. And I think it's getting in the way of effective policy being made. But, but I don't understand how you get over that. I, mean, I know you say you'll hire the best Democrats, you'll hire Republicans, but when you have conservatives who believe any form of compromise is compromising on principles. I mean, that, well, that's a lot. Some jam. people are that way. They're probably not going to be members of our coalition if they think they can't compromise on anything at all. We were uh, red governors in blue states, and we had to, in order to balance the budget, which not everybody wanted to do, we had to re reach across the aisle, which people in Washington have shown precious little uh, appetite to do uh, ever since the 1994 so, election. So when Donald Trump says, make America great again, do you believe America is... Is, is great. Has never, never been better. And that isn't to say that we don't have issues, but we should be dealing with those issues. The um, Governor Johnson, you recently said that if, if you had to describe Hillary Clinton in one word, the word you would use was beholden. Who is she beholden to? Well, when you look at, uh, really, it's... It it's just not coincidence, I don't think, that Bill Clinton um, and Hillary both uh, are making huge amounts of money uh, uh, with these speaking fees. Uh, I mean, it's there are others that look at this, uh, Anderson, or, or I don't want to throw rocks at this, but um, really, it's a, it's, it's a pay to play. It's just not... Um, so it's beholden not by, to, to big money donors, beholden to Wall Street? Well, the, their own interests, if you will, that they're making money off of this, that they're making money off of this, uh, uh, that as Secretary of State, um, Bill goes out, does a million dollar speaking gig, and then um, oh, the next day, uh, Hillary signs an agreement with uh, the sponsor of that uh, speaking gig, and, you know, that's, that's not good. That's, that's beholden, if you want to say that. You, it's, it's smacks of pay to play, and I think it goes beyond just smacks of pay to play, that it's really something that's out there. Governor Well, I know you know you've known Hillary Clinton for a long time. I think you shared an office once long right, ago. Right. Uh, do you agree with that assessment? Is she beholden? Well, I think what Gary has said is, is factually accurate. Uh, my my principal beef with the uh, 
Democratic uh, proposals coming out of the convention is the trillion dollar tax hike. That's with a T. Uh, the Tax Policy Center uh, costed out uh, Mrs. Clinton's proposed tax hike at a tr $1.1 trillion. And, you know, like I say, Gary and I both balanced the budget, in fact, cut the budget. And I cut taxes 21 times. He cut taxes 14 times. And the unemployment picture greatly improved as a result of that. Uh, and that, I think, is the way to way to go. Not, the, the Democrats are going to have a very hard time avoiding increasing the $20, uh, $20 trillion national debt that we'll have uh, when President Obama leaves office. In fact, it looks as though it'll go in the other direction. I, when you were asked to describe Donald Trump in one word, the word you picked was huckster. Do you still, is that still the word you would use? Yeah, I think he's a, you know, he's a showman, he's a Pied Piper, he's the, he's the music man. Uh, but I've, more recently, it's gotten a little bit more serious, and, and the noun that comes to my mind is uh, a screw loose. Uh, and <laughs> you, you really think so? No, no, I do, I do. It's a, it's a temperamental question, and, and I, I say this almost uh, with affection for Donald Trump. Maybe he should consider some other line of work, like <laughs> anything other than President of the United States. You don't think he's... Governor Johnson, do you, do you agree? I mean, that he has a screw loose or that... Well, what, what, what we both like to talk about is, was there, anything that Hillary, uh, was there anything that Hillary didn't promise in her speech the other night? And then with regard to Donald Trump, uh, just starting off with immigration. We're a country of immigrants. We should be embracing immigration. We shouldn't be talking about restricting it. And then when he talks about killing the families of Muslim terrorists, when he talks about free trade, but in the next sentence he says, I'm going to force Apple to make their iPads and their iPhones in the United States and that we should apply a 35% tariff on imported goods. Well, who pays for that? Um, That's really, not a libertarian it, principle. It's not at all. And I think that uh, unfairly, the world has really connected uh, crony capitalism and free trade. They've, they've kind of, the thought is, is that it's one in the same when in fact uh, it's opposite. So we're all about free trade. We want to talk about that issue and a lot more coming up. Uh, stay right where you are. When we come back, questions from the audience. This is the CNN Libertarian Town Hall. We'll be right back.